Well, Dick, it's uh, very good of you to take the time to to spend with us uh, today. Um, you know, uh, I was thinking as I was uh, sort of planning for for this um, this uh, taping. Um, it, it's hard to imagine uh, Lexington without the Michelsons. Uh, where 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 did uh, it all start? Uh, how did uh, how did you happen to be here, your family? Well, basically, uh, back in the early 1900s, my grandfather, my father's father, uh, and his family, uh, some of the family, came to America and ended up settling in the Brockton area and into the shoe factories is where they were working, you know, and established themselves down in that area uh, in manufacturing of shoes and byproducts of shoes, the findings and, and so forth that uh, go into the components of making shoes. And from the best of my knowledge, uh, somewhere in association, the Michelsons and the Selsa family Julius Seltzer was a uh, tailor here in Lexington. He had a tailor shop uh, on the corner of uh, Marion Street and Mass Avenue in the large three-story old uh, central block, which had burnt down in the 40s, in the 60s, 70s. It was. Uh, but the, his shop was right on the corner. And he encouraged, some through some communications, my grandfather and his brother to come to Lexington to, they needed a harness uh, and repair shop in Lexington. Harness repair? Harness repair and uh, shoe repair boots and stuff for the farmers. And that's what the community was, basically a farming community, as everybody knows. So uh, I'd say that uh, the opportunity was taken up by the, my grandfather his brother apparently came a little bit first and set up a shop. My grandfather came in and, and uh, basically fell into it as a better solution than, the, than his brother was. His brother left the area. My grandfather took over and ran it uh, from 1919. Adding at the time, you know, into work boots, you know, some children's shoes, you know, things that were being asked for by the few residents in the Warren town uh, so that he could make a living out of retailing and also repairing. Now, when did your grandfather come to this country? Uh, in the early 1900s. I don't have an exact date. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and uh, did he have anything, his family have anything to do with shoes in the old country? I can't relate back to that. I, I assume they did because they did go immediately into the Brockton area, so generally those people, when they came from the old country, had some reason and some previous trade you know, that they knew of, so they, the easiest thing for them to do was to get a job you know, when they got off the boat and, and got here. So. Yeah, and something that, with which they were familiar. Um, you and I know, but uh, I bet most of our audience doesn't know that Brockton was the great shoe center uh, for for decades. Uh, it's it's all gone now, isn't it? To have any no, shoe business. There's, there's still some uh, manufacturing of shoes done in the in that area. Uh, we carry one brand actually, the Alden Shoe, which is made in Middle Middletown, uh, Mass. Uh, but there's very little left in the area at all. You know, it's basically the Manufacturing of shoes is left most of New England as a little bit down up in Maine. So a little few shops and few uh, factories up in New Hampshire, but most of New England is mm -hmm. completely uh, void of it now. Yeah, due, just, due to the major problem of uh, 
yeah. competition of the other foreign countries. Yeah, and the textile business the same way. But now people think of Brockton, they think of Rocky Marciano, and that's about it. That's it, Tom, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got a statue of him down there somewhere. Yeah, finally. Uh, now, do you do you know, did you ever hear how how your grandfather met uh, Julius Seltzer? I, I never did find out. No. Mm -hmm. But that was, as I say, when they're from the old country or what it was, there was some, some association that mm -hmm. you know, encouraged him to come in here. And, mm -hmm. well, where did your grandfather live when he first came? When he came into Lexington, they rented on Jackson Court. Oh, really? Off of Parker Street. Mm -hmm. Short little street there. And, house uh, still standing? The house is still there that they, that they rented. And then uh, he bought the piece of land at 29 Parker Street and he built a house on that, which is still standing. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the family lived in that. Uh, uh, my aunt ended up living there, and her husband lived, ended up living there uh, into the about, probably, uh, I think it was. Fifteen years ago, when she passed away, and mm -hmm. the house was finally sold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and Seltzer, I I remember him because I moved to town in 1949. He was a major factor in the Lexington Minutemen Company. Mm -hmm. He he made all the uniforms for the Minutemen back when they organized, and he designed them and made them all in his own tailor shop. He's quite a tailor shop. In fact, my father used to, on his bicycle, deliver the uh, cleaning and the alterations that Julius Seltzer used to do. That's one of my father's jobs back years when he was in high school. Uh -huh. He was riding his bike around town delivering the, uh, the uh, Julius Seltzer's, uh, 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 to back to Julius Seltzer's customers. Yeah. Julius Seltzer also uh, was the initiating force of the Minuteman memorial statue, which is beside the Buckman Tavern. He, he, it was all his efforts uh, that uh, organized it, raised the money, had it designed, and, and uh, put it into the spot. Because of Julius House, that, mon that monument's there. That's a very dramatic monument. Did uh, some of the Minutemen at the time pose for that, do you remember? I am not sure who, who did the uh, posing for it, but it was a very well done, the listing on the back was, at that point, uh, pretty authentic, and I guess they've added a few since then, yeah, right. if, that they found out in history that people that were uh, at the battle that were right. not included on the list. Right. But it was for Julius Seltzer who did it all, and I recall very, very much so the testimonial that was run for Julius Seltzer in the Old Belfry Club, uh -huh. and, uh, back then, and years ago, uh, there was a tremendous crowd uh, giving him a testimonial for all of it he had done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that uh, that statue is the end of the Minutemen militia's line. I mean, they they were across Bedford Street, not where we do it today. Yeah, it was, There's a rock at one end of the line, and that that uh, it, it's it's significant for the uh, history. Right. Where it's located. Right. So, so how long did, uh, did he keep the tailor shop? Uh, I don't know what point of, of uh, it was in the history when it finally closed, but it was, he was a very old gentleman at the time he finally shut it down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Before the, well, it was long before the building did burn down, so. Yeah. Oh, the day yeah. of the building burning oh, down. Yeah. So, so where was your grandfather's, uh, and shoe repair, and then he began to get into the selling of well, the first, where was The it? first location of the store is on Mass Avenue in the same block we're in now, and it was close to Muzzy Street. The entrance to Will's Coffee Shop, oh, where yeah. I now, that was the entrance to the shoe store, where that, their doorway is, was the entrance to the Michelson Shoes, the repair shop and the shoes. On the corner, to the right of that, on the right on Muzzy Street corner, was Gray's Market, which was a grocery store, convenience store for downtown. And uh, they had a, actually had a diagonal angle entrance on the corner. Mm -hmm. 
not just straight in, it was uh, on an angle type of entrance. I have a picture in the store that shows that building that should have brought it with me, but it does show the building that uh, Sam Dorman uh, dug it out of uh, Wizard's books, I believe, I, uh, some of his photographs, and it shows the edge of the shoe store and at the entrance way mm -hmm. and the, the Gray's Market there. What was upstairs? Uh, apartments. Yeah. Uh, that building goes back to the, uh, those days, in the 1900s, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, from that point, uh, in the, I would say it was probably uh, around 26 or so, we moved the, uh, the market, wanted to expand, so the Michelsons moved one store closer to where we are now, which is where the Avenue Deli is now. Uh -huh. And that's what, that was the location there. And we were there until 1940 when we moved into the location here, in the, uh, which is one third of where the theater pharmacy is now, closest to the uh, movie theater. So you've been in that location for 70 years now. Well, the 1940. 40 we moved into the, into the into the block, and then in '65 we moved to the location. Oh, now. okay. We've been in this location since 19, 1965. Now, what what did uh, what did that whole block like it look like when you were a kid? Well, what the, was there? Uh, you yeah, said it was. Uh, it was five stores. Yeah. Located in five stores. Uh, there was the. Uh, Duran's ice cream parlor, yeah, where, yeah. Okay, where we are, there was a Lappin, I ran that with her husband. That became Brigham's at one time. There was Blake's uh, China Shop, Charlie Blake had a China Shop in there, where that makes up the two stores that we're in, Duran, Duran's and for Brigham's and Blake's. There was a uh, various types of stores there that I can remember, a Crockett's Flower Shop in the very next store, which would be the central piece of that block. Allen the Electrician had a shop there, or Charlie Allen had a shop where in another piece of it. Uh, there's been different uh, different stores that have been through that. There was block. a butcher shop in there for a while. Well, where we are right now was the first AMP market. Oh, yeah. And I have a, one. One wall of my store, from between us and the theater pharmacy, is all the tiles of the back of the back of the of the meat market. Oh, uh, that, was one of the, that was probably the first location of the AP meat market in Lexington. Right, uh, and then we have the tiles are still on the wall, black and white, white and black tiles. So, what in your little uh, office? In our shop, no, in our in our, uh, our stockroom. Oh, okay. to the right side there, behind yeah. that bundle counter, and yeah. yeah, that whole that whole line there. And there was a hardware store in there somewhere, and no, Smith's Paper Shop store. Was no, Smith's there. Paper Store was was uh, located where the TD Bank North is now in that building, mm -hmm. and they were in the left side of that doorway. That was an arcade like, and Smith's Paper Store was on one side, and then the arcade small shops on the other side. And uh, the hardware stores, uh, where uh, the I look is the uh, eye shop where uh, Valentine's is, uh -huh. before Reconturers in the corner, that was that Waverly Hardware, and that went in and around out to Wall to Walter Street, that was an L-shaped. Mm -hmm. Then across the, across the street from us, was the old Hunt Block building, and there was Lawrence High when it was over there. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a lot of changes in the downtown, you know. Uh, we used to have Ross Furniture on the corner of that block across the street from me, the, the old Hunt Block. And they had a gas pumps around the corner in Depot Square, an entire shop. Mm -hmm. The furniture store out front, auto uh, uh, gas station, and, and uh, tires and stuff like that in the, in the side of it. Uh, Times changed a lot. Stopping the first national used to be uh, in the empty block now where Coho's used to be back years ago, and then Papers Department store came in there. 
we're down the line, you know, we've had five and so many changes in town. It's five and ten, where the CBS is. CBS is, is right. What, was there a greater variety of businesses in town then? The downtown has changed drastically. I mean, the downtown has changed from having a complete variety of businesses from clothing stores, Baker's Dry Goods Store, which is where the, uh, where the uh, Bank of America is now. That was a block set back there. Mm -hmm. bank that uh, Gabe Baker and Bessie Baker owned. Oh, yeah. And they had a yard goods and children's clothing and women's clothing in there. Of course, Bateman's department store, as I said, they had all kinds of clothing for everybody down there. Don't forget, it was the bowling alley. There were, there were three, two bowling alleys downtown Lexington, underneath the, where uh, we could say DeSalle's, the Coho's building. The can, candle pin is still in the, above that doorway. Mm -hmm. That indicated that the bowling alley downstairs. In fact, I was talking to somebody uh, the other day who was in that building uh, this week, looking at space, and the bowling alley is still downstairs. They just raised the floor up. It and is. Uh, covered up the alleys down there. Yeah. Right. Underneath where Sickness the Stationery is, the barber shop and the theater, that was a bowling alley and, and a pool room downstairs there. But the theater was always there. The theater's always been there, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a, basically a vaudeville type theater to start with. Mm -hmm. and, you know, with the stage and everything else down there. You know. And this uh, Peter Sy has done a great job of restoring what was there in the in the appearance, interior appearance, with the exposing the ceiling and cleaning the place up. Mm -hmm. He's doing a great job in there now. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't have those big, wide brick sidewalks with the trees and the flower barrels and stuff, did we? No, no, the street was uh, actually Narrower was angle parking on the north side of the street and parallel parking on the right side. Uh, back in 65, 1965, I was on a committee which uh, we was a revitalization committee for the downtown. And at that point, when we had uh, hired architectural services and consultants to come in and design, redesign how the center could look and basically how it looks today, kept straightening out the line of buildings because if you take the block where CVS is, that straight line down stopped at the corner where the uh, Bank of America is. Now that, at that lot, it jut jutted out. Trainee had his grocery store and liquor store on the, real, on the corner of that, on the east corner of that building, and then it came up all the way out, those buildings were out. The hut block, which I referred to, which across from us, which was a three-story building, and then the central block, the other side of the Depot Square, was a three-story building. Mm -hmm. and, all, and the design that was proposed was to eventually make that straight line along the CVS block and straight up, mm -hmm. including what is the, where uh, where uh, Nourish now, is. Where you presently, yeah. presently see now. It's a straight line up coming up there now. Mm -hmm. And that was done through, you know, efforts, uh, financial changes and opportunities for the people who, who own those properties. The first one, which uh, was where, the, where uh, Bank of America is, that was originally owned by a fellow by the name of, of uh, Dan, uh, Dan, Dan O'Connell. And he was also if you go back to the record, he was took a position you had a selectman years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, he had made a deal with the town to, to take his front piece, draw a line through his building when they wanted to, and he uh, you know, made a financial agreement. Well, that happened, but then they had to redo that with the property change, so mm -hmm. the town was involved with that. The Hunt Block, uh, when they came to wanting to widen the street there, that block was purchased by the uh, three people, uh, Hugo Mienza, Joe Traney, and uh, uh, Stevens, I think it was his first name. And Not the town council, Stevens. No, no, no. And uh, they agreed to tear the building down, the town was going to pay for it, and they built a one-story building there. Mm -hmm. Set mm -hmm. back in the line, mm -hmm. the town line. Mm -hmm. 
and the hut blocked that bird down. Mm -hmm. And at that point, uh, Jeru owned the property, and he built the he Jeru and Cody Brown and Matheson uh, on about that building. That property he built there was we built it there. So the changes have been, you know, in the construction outside of the street has been basically the same with other than the updates uh, mm -hmm. and let's see the uh, we can go back to where the Battle Green Inn was and it used to be a, a uh, diner on that property and the Walgreens diner and and uh, houses on the along the line and all those have that mm -hmm. changed so mm -hmm. Now tell me about Michelson's. Your your uh, father worked in the store. Beginning how old? Uh, well, as I say, he talks about well, when I was in high school. We went to Lexington High. He went to Ed Car School in Lexington and graduated Lexington High School. And I got his I got his graduation picture still in the store. You know, I'm in the uh, class. You know, we have that. Uh, he worked for a seltzer and then he came and worked for his father. Uh -huh. you know, there. And uh, back in the 40s, uh, my grandfather took, basically wanted to get out of it, took a little sickness and wanted to get out of it. My father took over the business. Uh -huh. And uh, back in That the, was in the 40s. Right. Did your father have brothers and sisters? Yep. He had uh, there were five siblings. Wow. Uh, and uh, the my grandfather did set up a store in Concord years ago, back then, that uh, called, was called Harold's Store in Concord. It was mostly for my father. That didn't last but a year. Mm -hmm. But my grandfather also set up in the Heights a shoe store for my aunt and her husband, when mm -hmm. she got married. And they ran the store in the Heights for a number of years. Uh huh. And uh, that was called Harold's also. Mm -hmm. So they, my grandfather anticipated my my father was going to go into it, but he never did. He stayed with the business. So your father was the only one that really yeah, uh, stayed and, in the Lexington. And his sister, yeah, and his sister went, oh, down, okay. went down there, Aaron, Aaron and Elizabeth Shulman went in there. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And then you started working in the store. Pretty young age, didn't you? Well, I was in there doing everything as a kid, and uh, we had a repair shop, and I was in. I learned the repair business from my father, my grandfather. Shine shoes. We, had, uh, we used to have a shine stand and uh, two seater shine stand. We had polish shoes. Back years ago, uh, when somebody initiated, they came up with better. They Shine machine on a brush with a flexible tool. My father bought it so we could polish shoes with a power shine machine. That was one of the first ones that we still got the machine, in fact, still runs. There's a few repairs on it, but it works. But I did that and, uh, you know, went to graduate Lexington High, went on to myself, I went on to Newton Junior College for two years, went on to BU, graduate BU. Uh, business school. Came out of there and uh, Uncle Sam sent me a letter. Please report to the Tawanda Club in Woburn in October of 56. I went over there, got drafted. Spent two years in the service. Uh, a year and a half of love. I was over in Germany. Came back. Back in the business uh, and got married in 59. Three children, two of them in the business. My wife works in business, so it's a family operation. Yeah. You know, I'm the third generation. My boys are the fourth generation. I got seven grandchildren. Two of those work. Uh, two of the girls work uh, uh, the business, and my daughter's children. Uh, one's in college now. Just finished her first year in Wheaton, and. Uh, uh, the other one's going to be a senior in high school. I have uh, another granddaughter a senior in high school. Two of them will be in uh, high school next year as freshmen. A couple of them will be in Clark. So uh, things progress. 
Yeah, yeah. What will happen in the future, we don't know. Hopefully one of the fifth generations will come in and uh, continue business. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Years. There's always been somebody in the generation that was interested in in the business and staying there. Now Eric and Jerry are. I, I had a I had a brother David, who was he was older than me. He was never interested in the business, and as he he was a basically became an engineer and uh, had his own business going. Mm -hmm. He wasn't interested. I was, and I stayed with him. So. Mm -hmm. Both my sons, you know, they they had the chance of coming into the business, not coming into the business. Both of them, unfortunately, have made the choice of coming into the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, back uh, twenty three years ago, I think it was, I I bought a second location down in Needham. A friend of mine had a family had a shoe store down there into the second generation, and. Uh, they really didn't want to continue it. I went in and picked it up, so I have a second location in Needham. Uh huh. Okay. In, the in anticipation that my son's, you know, I know my oldest son Eric, that was interested in coming into business, and I was thinking that it'd be a good setup. If, you know, if one wanted to be down there, why not? But it turns out I have a manager and excellent crew down there, which runs that store, and we. Do the general operation from Lexington, anyways, Ollie, and both boys that work in Lexington with me. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it's interesting that when Eric was in college, both boys went to University of Vermont, and when Eric was up there, he worked for a shoe store up in in uh, Vermont. Did he? And uh, you know, learned what it was like to work for somebody else in in the shoe business, and that's how he wanted to say it. Mm -hmm. uh, he. Eric worked uh, at Chicago College, and actually in his last year of college, worked to uh, develop a help a, develop an inventory, computer inventory control system, which we have, which has been updated. These uh, young people, they learn computers like it's nothing these days, as you know. Mm -hmm. you know the grandchildren can do everything with it, and I, I'm still a novice at it, I'm afraid it's going to break it, but uh, they both have developed. Uh, the systems we have now, Jerry was instrumental in getting a point of sale system up and running and keeps that going. So they have uh, that's all part of running the business, operating in a two locations. You need the complete control. I also rent a 3,100 foot square warehouse in Burlington to keep my inventory in because of the. When you're in business like we are, we have to have a large enough inventory and have to buy it out of season because uh, your, your boots come in in July mm -hmm. and don't start selling those until August, September. Yeah. You have to have a place to warehouse them, so yeah. I also have that. So. And, and um, all three of you, you don't, don't just uh, stay in that office of yours. Uh, you're out there on the floor fitting shoes all the time as well as... That's what, that's what I have impressed upon them. It's so important that you have to be, know what the customers, deal with the customers, know what the customers want. Know whether be out there to put out any, we call it fires in the, you know, when there's a problem out there, you have to be out there to take, make sure you're out there to uh -huh. take care of it, so, you know. How many people you got working there besides Eric and Jerry? I employ 25 people between the two stores. Do you? And mostly full time and some part timers. Yeah. yeah. So in Lexington, we always have at least 8 to 12 people on the sales floor, including ourselves all the time. Yeah. You, you talked about uh, having a shoe shining operation and a repair operation. No, it, it, there isn't even anybody on the street corner shining shoes anymore. What's that about? Sales so won't. I mean, the the uh, selectman won't get permission for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. No, no, it's uh, it's you don't see it on the street. You you don't see. Uh, I guess if you go to the uh, train stations, you might see. A, you know, the still got the shine boys and all of that. But, you know, that type of thing. No. They say we used to have the shine stand, which was very popular. But why why don't they do it anymore? Well, it's labor intensive. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sue repairing is still a, you know, it's a, basically a lost act, and you have you know people that are still in. Unfortunately, in Lexington, you have the the gentleman around the corner on Waltham Street, and he's basically there's a gentleman that came in from Russia and was in shoe in shoe repairing and shoe manufacturing over there, and he does a great job and does an all job. Second repair shop in behind. Where craft cleaners craft cleaners are. Yeah, right. So you have two, two repair shops on this. But why did you guys get out of the repair business? We got out of it, number one, because we needed space for our inventory. Okay. And the fellow that we had in the repair, doing our repairs, working with us, you know, a, a major repairman, who we were always on, uh, hands on. And one thing I gotta tell you is that my father, Used to be in the shop, mid latest, five four thirty five every morning, to make sure that you could get things done that you couldn't do when the customers were out front. Mm -hmm. And you know, repairing is is all hands on and and uh, hard work. But the fellow who worked for us, a, D a Danny Paul Carey, uh, when we said we wanted to, you know, do away with it, and asked him if he like us to set him up in, in this repair business in another location, Lexington. He definitely wanted it. And we set him up in, on Bedford Street, uh, where the video store is, uh, Alexander's Pizzas, oh, yeah. up on Bedford Street, that block there. Uh, the next to the, where the, where the video store is, the next store that we set him up in with all our equipment, everything else, and he ran that repair shop for number of years. Mm -hmm. Well, why why isn't, uh, I mean, I remember shoe repair, very, very big business. Is it because shoes last longer now, or? Uh, a lot of shoes aren't repairable. Oh. It's a, thro okay. it's a throwaway society. You know, you buy a product and, you know, and, you know you don't, they're not made to be repaired in some cases. Mm -hmm. Those that are can be repaired, good quality product. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's definitely repairable. Mm -hmm. That's why the, there are shoe repairments still in the area, still around. But it's hard to find the good ones there. Young people don't want to go in their business anymore. Again, as I say, it's very labor intensive, very mm -hmm. easy. You know. mm -hmm. Rather go into banking or computers, huh? Well, whatever they trade us, you know. Yeah. You know back, in, back in the days when we had repairing, uh, just after the war, you can show the picture there that the, the uh, repair shop, one of the gentlemen on the shoe repair, the tall gentleman, uh, he was a uh, army veteran out of Kentucky and my father had gone into a program with the government uh, to train shoe repair people. And he, we were training him how to repair shoes. Cool. Uh, so, uh, you know, whatever you could, we try to keep people in the business. Now, in 1919, it was essentially a repair shop. Um, a farmer's boots and stuff, and you said you began to sell some children's shoes. Uh, Basically, it was it was an idea was to have work boots for the farmers, and then you, they they come in with their families and say, you know, what can I put on them? And, you know, it was a matter of building up, you know, inventory to accommodate the, the whole family. Yeah, not just children, the whole family. Type. Yeah, it was a family operation. Now, when I walk into your store now, I am dazzled by the variety. The shoe business has changed from, dramatically, obviously, since 1919, but, but has it changed a lot in, say, the last 20 years or so? No, I used to, you know, have fashion items, you know, cheap or expensive, which we, are, we don't go into the high fashion stuff. The basic merchandise is still basic merchandise, comfort, you know, having shoes that, you know, uh, come in the various widths and sizes to be fit properly, you know, all that is still around, you know, mm -hmm. so as far as the industry changing, you know, it's changed, yes, because of the type of manufacturing, the way they're manufactured, but the retailing still is retailing. Mm -hmm. our, our business is all service. 
You go to self-service places, it's a different story. You know, but when you walk in to our store, you're greeted, you're seated, and you're fed. And that's, you know, that's what it amounts to. That's why we've been there as long as we have, and hopefully we stay that way. You mean the self-service shoe stores? A lot of them. How, how, I, I can't imagine how that would work. Stacks of boxes. <laughs> People go in. Never had their feet measured. Put them on. Walk out with them. We measure feet. People walk into our store. We ask them to sit down. We like to measure your feet. Oh, I wear a size seven and a half. Well, let's find out. Sit them down. I haven't been in my feet measured for years. Sit down. Let me measure your feet. That's where we find out that they might have used to wear seven and a half. Yeah, feet, yeah. But now they need an eight and a half. Yeah. And they complain about how their feet hurt. Yeah. They keep the foot doctors in business. Yeah, right. Our, our way of doing business is to fit them right, fit them with the, with the proper shoes, and all of a sudden they're different people. Mm -hmm. When your feet hurt, everything else hurts. Yeah. And, you know, and, it's just another thing. And, and we get referred to by doctors, foot doctors, orthopedic men from all over Greater Boston because they know when they, when their patients come to the store, it's like sending a patient to a drugstore with a prescription. Mm -hmm. you know? If it's filled properly, hopefully it helps their patient. Mm -hmm. When they say they're a patient with foot problems, they have to get the right shoes on the feet, or else they're wasting their time, the patient's wasting their time. Mm -hmm. And we have the battle constantly with many of our customers saying, I wouldn't wear that shoe. So well, that's the shoe you have to wear to solve your problem. Whether it be plantar fasciitis, which is a big thing out there with, with the heel spurs and stuff like that, or not. But if you don't wear the right shoes, you know, don't spend the money to the doctor. Mm -hmm. oh, it's a, it's what our, that's what our, we have to do is you know, try to advise them, fit them right, and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully they come back and thank us for it and say that, gee, you were right. Mm -hmm. well, we know we're right. Just, yeah, a matter, right. just a matter of them right. you know, accepting it. So, uh, now, you've been, Dick, you've been terrifically active in town over many years with the Chamber and, and Discovery Day and, and uh, town meeting and everything. Um, how uh, how has the town changed in the last 25, 30 years? How's the town changed? Well, in downtown we know how it's changed. We've lost right. most of our stores that were the apparel stores, you know, this type of variety. The, the chain or the chain stores have come in a little bit. Some have stayed, some have not, uh, depending on how they're they, their headquarters feel their volume should be. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we're in a day with banks, which everyone is, knows about. And two more banks coming to town right now. The, there was one time in Lexington Center, there were five active open shoe stores. Really? Okay. We were one of them, there were four others. Now there's only one. It's good, but it's bad, because people you know, need a reason. We're a destination place. People come to our store from all over this area. Southern New Hampshire, and North Shore, and everywhere. Unfortunately, because we have the reputation that people come here. We have people that used to live in Lexington, that are in California. When they're back from anywhere, they come into my shoes. Mm -hmm. Holidays are a big time for us because the parents, grandparents come in and one of their destinations is Michelson's. Can you get my shoes there? So, uh, but then one time there were five shoes to us. And like some sort of all up and, and active. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's uh, that one of the town, one of the, one of the surveys down in the town at that time, like they said, there's too many banks in town now. Back then they said there were too many shoe stores in town. Yeah, right. Okay. They say there's too many beauty shops in town. You know, they, you know, there's always a situation of the balance. But, you know, for one reason or another, they leave and other things come in. 
Has town meeting changed? Uh, yeah, I see. I went through a lot many moderators. <laughs> yeah, well, right. I go back to Bob Kent and mm -hmm. uh, Cole and uh, you know, Madge. Uh, the, the makeup of town meeting has changed drastically. I, I feel, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that come in for a purpose mm -hmm. and then leave. You know, a lot of people come into town for a purpose and leave. A lot of people come into the town for their education, educate their children, and then leave. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen that right down the line. You know, it's a, the trend change of population is there. And, you know, turnover of houses is every every neighborhood sees. You know, turnover. But uh, the the escape of the town has changed, you know, with the loss of the farms, you know, the building, the developments. Lexington Garden was a big loss. That's going to be a development. That was a big attraction of the town. You know, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, areas that have changed drastically because of that. The ranchization of housing has changed the population because of the person who could afford that small cape can't buy that small cape anymore. Yeah, right. Okay? You know, so it's, uh, you know, it's the way the economy has gone, the way the pe people want things. They want the, the big houses, what do they do with them, I don't know. But they, that's what they, they feel they want. They want to have a show place, they have a show place. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, so those people change the makeup of the town. Yeah. They change up the weather that's... Different like, kind of people in right. town. Right. And, Say the you know hands on dirty working labor is not available. You know how many how many town employees live in Lexington anymore? Well, right. okay. There was a time, and I remember it distinctly. If you did a little Lexington, you couldn't get a job in Lexington. Mm -hmm. Couldn't get a fire job. Couldn't get a police job. Couldn't get a public works job. You couldn't be actually be superintendent of, of any of the branches of the town unless you live in Lexington. Mm -hmm. okay. That's all changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, you know, I've heard excuses why, you know, it's time, but, you know, but when you're spending taxpayers' money, it'd be nice to you spending some of your own, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of my feelings. That yeah. Out there. Boy, would your grandfather be surprised if he <coughs> could come back to Lexington today. He'd hardly recognize you. My father would be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> he, you know, he passed away in 79, but you know, he, yeah. even in that period of time has changed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No question. Yeah. yeah. And presumably it will continue to change. Oh, I'm sure it will. Yeah. And hopefully, as I say, you know, back to the business and district, hopefully that gets a turn around too and stop to see some of these vacant stores being occupied again. Mm -hmm. and hopefully we see some of the Tip to different types of business coming in, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. But over the years, you know, you know that I've taken part in the town, the town meeting, you know, I've seen the, you know, the big change. Right now. I've been in town meeting for 46 years, I think it is now. Mm -hmm. so I think I get you beat. I got you beat by two years. Yeah, but you were there constantly. That's okay. So absolutely. I've been, I've been there all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean. I took no no vacations. Yeah, I didn't. Oh, uh, I guess you could call it a vacation. It was a break. You know. Break, I know. I'm trying to Tell me about that old vehicle. What an old vehicle? Come on now. It's only 90 years old. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, uh, Dan, I was thinking for years of somehow to celebrate our 90th year and our 100th year, which I hope to be around for. Uh, working my best to stay that way. Uh, so I was been online for the last probably five, six years and asking around friends of mine who were in the antique uh, classic car business, or owned them, I should say, where I could find a good 1919 vehicle. And uh, two years ago, came up with this picture of a 1919 Model T Ford. It's a depot hack, it's called. It's a, the type of car that the truck that they used to take the people from the railroad station to the hotel in. Well, you know, that was after the, well, just after they had horse drawn it, and then they Ford built the the uh, Model T. So I, I inquired about it, uh, made a phone call, followed up the 
picture online, which I'm, as I told you, I'm not a computer or a, a geek at all. I have no trouble turning the switch on. But uh, call out there to Minnesota and uh, talk to the gentleman who was advertising it. And he told me all about it. Told me it had been restored. A friend of his had it. A friend was, uh, had some uh, health problems and uh, wanted to get rid of it. And uh, told me the condition was in. Made the, the idea as to how much it would cost to bring it out to, to Lexington from there and transport it out. Short of the story is, I said, okay, I'll sound like a deal, I'll buy it. He called me back a couple of days later and said, look, he says, uh, I'm, I'm going to come out to uh, the show in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He says, the largest antique car show there is. He says, uh, if you don't mind, he says, I'll put it on my trailer, I'll bring it out to you, deliver it to you, and uh, then I'll go on with an empty trailer to Harrisburg to see what I buy. He said, I haven't been in New England. For a long time, he says, so and my wife will come out. At that point, I said, well, I guess I'm pretty confident. My wife, had, my wife just said to me, how do you buy something like that without sight on scene from a picture? Mm -hmm. I said, well, at that point, as a man bringing it out, I guess I felt, and I said, well, I said, well, I guess, you know, I can take a chance. And I did. And he came out with it and uh, had it. Deassembled some of the uh, part of it because it was too high for the trailer. It was a covered trailer and came out and we put it all together and he showed me how to run it. And uh, Model T's are uh, one of the hardest things to run there is because of the pedals and the gas on the adjustment on the steering wheel and so forth. But uh, showed me how to run it, showed my boys how to run it. And uh, Stevie Newell in Lexington, ex police officer, he's had a Model T for years and he, he gave us driving lessons. And uh, I still have a solo in it, but uh, my boys uh, love it. They take it around town, use it, uh, you know, taking kids around and having to pray. My youngest son Jerry's down at, uh, has one youngster left in the Harrington School and Harrison School uh, is having their fair this weekend, and he's going to have it down there to give rides to the kids on. So uh, it's a symbol of, of uh, the year that our store was started. And, uh, you know, I fortunately have a place to keep it, a barn, and like I said, I can keep it in, so storage and one of these things is it. You keep it at the house? No, I have, a, I have another spot in town and I keep it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's in great shape. I have a, of course, I have a mechanic who, a young fellow lives in, uh, in Andover, who does nothing but tease. I found out about him, who had problems that we can't, that my boys can't handle. He would call, he comes down and sorts me out and picks me up, gives me the parts. So, uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, the kids enjoy it, great children enjoy it. You know, it's, a, it's an heirloom for the business. Yeah, yeah and, and, uh, and the say, people watching the parade enjoy it. Yeah. So, but. so, I say, you know, Come uh, 2019, hopefully it's still running. Hopefully I can ride it. Why not? <laughs> Why not? I've uh, seen you around town doing lots and lots of things. We mentioned, I mentioned the town meeting and the, and the chamber. Uh, didn't mention the Lions, where you've been so active and involved. Um, what, uh, and Discovery Day, you you picked that up, didn't you, and kept it going. Um, when you when you look back over your long involvement in the town, what to, what other things uh, pop out for you? Uh, oh. Why did you get that white tricorn? Well, I I I my activities go back even as a youngster. You know, being involved as much as I could with the downtown. Back uh, uh, previous uh, years, before I went in the Army, actually, uh, I was involved with the Chamber. We had a what we called a retail division of the Chamber, and I was involved with most of the retail activities that were, up, were done uh, as far as the promotions go, uh, whatever we could do to uh, you know, keep business active in the town. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, fact when I went in the service back in '56, the chamber even gave me a the engraved watch, thanking me for a, for the amount of time I had spent. You know, back that far. Back that far. Okay. Wow. So that from there on, the uh, uh, we came out of the service and continued to get involved. I was on the chamber board directors, uh, president of the chamber uh, for. Two, two years anyway, if not more. I was a board director of the chamber for about 25 years until the chamber finally made the decision of uh, limiting the term and also not getting involved with retailing that they used to be involved with. That's one reason that we broke away because when they gave up Discovery Day, which I was one of the initiators of, you know, showing what the town had to offer, offer in businesses, yeah, right. everybody once a year, uh, you know, at that point we made a decision it was well worth it, even though certain people in the town didn't feel it was, and we've continued, as you know, and very, very successful this year. 29th of, of uh, May, uh, Saturday, for Memorial Day, we've already got a full house packed mm -hmm. uh, for the back, back room. Mm -hmm. That's one of the activities. But I also was involved with the bicentennial mm -hmm. in the town. I was put on the committee by the selectmen and uh, did the work the committee bicentennial, getting all the planning done. Uh, we worked uh, night after night committee, week after week. It was constant working. Made arrangements uh, for all the activities. Money had to be raised to offset it. I myself and Five other people in town uh, set up a bicentennial corporation, independent nonprofit corporation. At that point, we minted the coins, the bicentennial coins. We took the uh, wood from the flagpole, which had been hit by lightning, and as we cut down, we made lots of wood, sold those with the inscription on it, both of it being part of the flagpole, bicentennial. We. Uh, Raised quite a bit, a lot of money. We sold these uh, coins throughout the world, which is still a collector's item. Uh, we bought the, paid for the flagpole that's on the green now, uh, replacing the old one. That was, couldn't get it done by the, by 75, but 76 is when we dedicated that new flagpole, which is a 126 feet tall, one of the tallest single standing flagpoles around. When I came back from the service, 58, there were a bunch of uh, fellows in Lexington that wanted to start a junior JC organization called Junior Chamber of Commerce at that time, but had nothing to do with the chamber. And so at that point, uh, when I came back, we organized the JC organization for Lexington, which was for young men up to the age of 35. If you were 35, you had to get out. Uh, the, uh, uh, at that point, we, one of our one of our activities was to get the flag on the green, recognize the balloon for 24 hours a day under lights. And it was the second congressionally approved flag flag plane for, for 24 hours a day under lights. Mm -hmm. Got a bill from the Congress of the United States. I have the pen that, that uh, Linda Berry Johnson signed the bill with. I have that in the store. I keep that pen well locked up. I bet. And, uh, that was Brad Morris. Uh, right. Yep. Yeah. And we got that uh, through. I uh, laid out, had all the light designed, and had uh, Steeple Jack uh, fix the lights up there on the on the halfway point, mm -hmm. on the old flagpole. That was one of my uh, big things. During the bicentennial planning, one of the Things that I'm most proud of is the fact that a group of us went down to Washington to invite the president to come up for the bicentennial. We were in the Oval Room with the president and President Ford. And uh, it was quite a thrill to fly down one morning. And uh, there, was, uh, there was five of us, I believe it was, that went down there. And, uh, Al Booza, Jack Maloney, Blue Ellen Kenny, uh, myself, Bob Tarlin, who was the uh, 
uh, director for the, hired by the town to be the director for the bicentennial activities. Went down, right into the Oval Room, sat down with the president. I gave him the uh, number one coin. We, this, the coins that we minted and, and had and sold were by number. This collects item. We say number one for the president of the both this, the gold and the silver coins for his collection. By him to, to, to be with us in the bicentennial time. And that was, as I say, that will always be one of my highlights of my life, being in that over room. And uh, we were successful. We couldn't get a commitment because of the world situation. But the answer was that if possible, he'd be here. And he came. And that was the year I received the white hat. And was sort of with that and sat in the front row during the president's arrival and, and shook his hand here in Lexington. And, and uh, my wife and I, will, my kids will never forget that activity. But uh, from there on, as you said, Dan, we, uh, uh, I'm still active and do the various things. Got the uh, Lexington Retailers Association started so we can continue the retail activities. The chamber dropped. We discussed the Discovery Day. We also do the Halloween Walk, which has been very, very successful. Uh, with the kids, we invite everyone downtown to walk to the stores and get to Halloween and, you know, we give out probably 1,200 pieces of candy that day. Mm -hmm. At least 1,200 kids come to one. People love it. It's a great mm -hmm. time. So this, this type of activity is what we, we try to keep people thinking of Lexington, people thinking of the downtown, thinking of the businesses care, and that's basically what uh, myself, my boys, and the other merchants that work with us uh, feel very strong that it's very important to keep the town to keep the town going very well. Well, Dick, you know that's what makes a community a community is those those kinds of activities. Aside from from the benefits to the to the business uh, businesses downtown, it just uh, it's really quite special, and uh, uh, our town, thanks to people like you, is quite special. I think so. You know, as I say, I've lived in it all my life. All my children live here. And it's a great place to be in, not from. Right. In. <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I think that uh, this is... It's a pleasure, you know, you know, having this opportunity to talk to you. And I'm, happy. I'm always around. Yeah, good. You know where to find me. I do indeed. <laughs> Anytime from 5.30 in the morning on, I'm at yes, the store. I so. do indeed. Thanks, Dick. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.